Hi, everyone. It's Minnie Kansman, and I'm here today with my partner, Neshi Lokatz, for Nature Adventures. And we are here on Be Live for um, Star Nations Radio Network. And our topic today uh, is all about the poets that, po that write poems about nature, so nature poets. And there's such a wonderful array of poetry, Neshi and I found as we um, research this topic, there's so many poets that write about the natural world. So, Neshi, are you ready to come on and join me? Yes, I am. <laughs> She's not. <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. I was. I was just getting my phone out so that um, I could. Oh, it's like time for liking and sharing. Yeah. 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 Um, do that now. You know when we first. First talked about doing this um, <clears throat> show, I I have been inspired because I've been using poetry with my forest therapy walks. And it was something that we were kind of introduced to in training, especially to use um, one of my favorite poets, Mary Oliver, who I'll be sharing about today. But that people really love to hear poetry, especially nature poetry when they're in a natural setting. It really sets the tone. Um, it gets them into their body rather than their their mind. They're they're really tuning into where they are by the descriptions in the in the in the poetry and the, the beautiful um, wordings and stanzas and rhythm of poems. I've always loved poems because of that, be, because of the rhythm and the movement. It's almost like a song that you speak with words. It's a good one, a song that you speak. Yeah. yeah. And Nessie and I were talking um, a little bit earlier about how poems, they take a while to digest. Mm -hmm. You don't just read it like you read a book or even you read a quote. Um, you read a poem, and I usually have to read it line by line and digest each. And what does that really mean? Or what is that painting a picture of for me? And I, I was researching um, Robert Frost, another mother poet, and he, he would say that people would say, well, what did you mean about that line? And what did you mean about that? And he wouldn't, he wouldn't tell him. He says, what do you think it means? What does it mean to you? Yeah. People will go off in all, oh, did you, were you talking about suicide in that poem? When, you know, he's like, I'm not saying anything, you know. <laughs> Cause, cause people will, will link that poem to, to what it means for them. Yeah. And so there isn't one, just one meaning, I think. And, and it could be different meanings for that same person, depending on when they read it in their life. You know, mm -hmm. let, let's say if you read the first time you read that poem, you might have been in high school or or you know, maybe a freshman or junior year in college, you're young, right? And then yeah. you don't, yeah. don't even think about it or see it again until maybe you're in your 30s or 40s. And the second time you read it, you think, oh my gosh, I remember this poem, but I don't remember it the, quite this way, you know? Right. So or I think some, like, what's going some on. Some life experience when you felt, and then it means something different, or you've experienced what they're talking about. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, it's like a relationship, actually, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. it evolves over time, and um, and it, there's some slight changes, but there's some things that remain constant. But sometimes it does mean something different. I mean, um, you and I both got married very young, right? Um, mm -hmm. Right around the same, I think it was like a year apart, wasn't it? Ours is in October, yours is in... August, August, um, 1980. Yeah, I was 20. I just 21, 21. And uh, we got married in October of 79. And so we were we were eight, yeah. 19 at the time. Um, but so, you know, it's different. I mean, you look back on that now. And here we are, you know, we've known each other for 40 years, Paul and I and it's like, it, there's some things that have remained the constant. But there's also some things that have changed over time and taken on different nuances than what it was way back when. And I think poetry is the same way. 
it's an it's it's a relationship that that evolves over time yeah mm -hmm. especially about nature especially about nature you know yeah. when i was when i was researching for the show and, and and selecting the poems that i wanted to bring um and it had me thinking about how you know the the, the cycles of nature right and that sometimes in some of the poems um that i was reading you could really feel that cycle in that poem mm -hmm. um that cycle of nature it's amazing amazing because i don't write poetry have you ever written poetry mm -hmm. yeah i used to write a lot of poetry in college in fact rain and i used to write poems to each other oh really but, um yeah we we wrote a lot of a lot of poems about missing each other you know because because we were separated for a bit so there were a lot of poems about missing each other and um how we felt about each other mm -hmm. uh, yeah he he kind of started it and then it kind of it got me doing it i wrote poems you know in school we had to write poems for some english classes and things wait rain wrote poetry does he still oh, write yeah. poetry has he ever mm, had written lately? What? I don't, not really, no. He wrote some, he wrote some really, really, um, you know, sad, po like very depressed, sad poetry too. Like before he met me, it was like, whoa. So I could see the difference after he met me, how, you know, in his, in his poems, they got a lot lighter and, and a, little, a little more joy filled. But yeah. A young man's angst. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But you know, yeah. this I, I wanted to also say that um this particular topic for this show and actually any of the shows that we do at Star Nations, I think this is the first time we've actually shared poetry on any yeah, of those yeah. as a main topic. Right. Right. We might have shared an image that had a poem on it, but yeah, that we focused on poetry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And even, I want to show this, um, the, our um, promotion for the show. Because mm -hmm. um, you designed this and I just loved it. I mean, the, the trees and the leaves, the autumn, right? And the poets right. and the yeah, I could see this being used for like, you know, even for live readings, you know, for um, to promote it, you know, to have people come in to listen to the live readings. I think that would be a really great show to do, too. Don't mm -hmm. you? I, I you realize yeah. that that we can't have like Robert Frost or uh, some of the other people that we know <laughs> because they're not here anymore. They walked on. But it doesn't yeah. matter. We couldn't we couldn't have. um People come in, you know, to actually read the poetry. That would be kind of cool. Isn't well, it? even people that we know, you know, that that write poetry, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of. There are, yeah. there are, or, or even to share your favorite poem, like um, at the Great Lakes Retreat on on Talent Night, or you know, they call it Variety Show Night. There have yeah. been a lot more people. Um, mm -hmm reciting poems oh more it's like spiritual poems it's it's really yeah. really cool now do you suppose it's you know that it's always been out there right poetry has mm -hmm. been around for a really long time and yet yeah we we seldom turn our attention to it until somebody says hey did you see that poem <laughs> Right. You know, some people are really tuned right. into it. Others aren't. Right. It's it's like you're a book person or you're a poem person. Sometimes it, it feels like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I really, I, I really got into you know this poet Mary Oliver. I really got into her after my training, and got that book last year for Christmas. Asked for it and also have one of her CDs of her reciting her poems, which I think is a really cool thing is to have 
you know, the, the poet reciting their own poetry that I, I'll just play in the car like a CD. And it's wonderful to be, you know, driving out in the country and having these nature poems going, you know, <laughs> going on the CD player. It's so different than music. So exactly. It's a yeah, different it form of car in entertainment. Yeah, but the, it's very um, lyrical too, depending on the kind of poem that it is. It can be yep. very lyrical. And I didn't know this. Rob, Rob um, Kendall actually said this to me in a chat chat room. I don't remember which show it was. We um, mm -hmm. were talking about uh, ballads and that's or poetry, actually. And and he said there are some, some poems that are meant to be lyrical lyrics that lend to mm -hmm. music. And then there's there's many poems that are not because they're, the intention is completely different. And, yeah. you know, yeah. for those of us that are more lay people about poetry, you know, we just assume that all poems can be put to music, but they can't. Right. Well, think about like there's choruses, you know, you repeat the chorus in the song a lot, but you don't in the poem a lot. You know, <laughs> maybe the last line repeats sometimes. But. Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. Well, there's so many different, different methods of writing poetry too. Um, and so, when you you're you were doing your research, how did you? Because we talked about this, guys, the audience. We talked about how uh, fun it was doing our research and selecting the poems. But I also found it a challenge because there's so many really good ones out there. And I also there was a part of me that wanted to to find um, po poets who weren't really well known, you know. Um, and I did find a few, but their poems were were really super long, <laughs> and I thought that you know, <laughs> that'd be hard to do, hard to do. I thought um, in the venue that we have on a live stream show, um, and so then I started looking for shorter poems. But um, how did you go about finding your poems for the show? Well, well, I knew I wanted to use Mary Oliver. That was that was easy. That the hard part was picking out which one or I picked two actually of hers, yeah. you know, that I really enjoyed. Um, the others were, you know, I was really, really focusing in on the nature, um, the nature topic. So mm -hmm. I went, I think I probably researched like nature poems and got a list and, and then I looked at them and I'm, Oh, I love, I love that one. Or I love that one. I remember, um, I remember reading that, you know, in high school and loving that one. Yeah. And I went went back and okay, that's and then I could apply it. I mean, like the Robert Frost one, I could apply to again to my forest therapy. So, mm -hmm. and then um, the Shel Silverstein is, is there's a whole story there which I'll share with you when we do him. But that that was a that was an artist that Rain introduced me to. So that was part of you know kind of Rain's type of poems too mm -hmm. but um, it's kind of a fam he's a family poet for us because we introduced our kids to him and okay. um, you know a lot of people know that he he sang songs but they they and they he wrote books but the poetry part they might not know about him so mm -hmm. there's some fun fun pieces and he's just silly and fun and um you know very um a different kind of poet than Robert Frost. Very different. What about you, Nashi? How 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 did you research yours? Oh my gosh. Um, well, I, I told you I wanted to find somebody who was wasn't as well known. Uh, but but what I ended up doing was um, selecting poems that I've read before and I had um, that had a deep meaning for me, rather than selecting a poem that I didn't had never read before. And, um, and so I, I went back into that direction. And so um, I ended up with Rumi and um, oh, yeah. and Joyce Kilmer. Um, and also um, Edwin, Edwin Muir. And so, <laughs> so you know, kind of went back to, to the tried and true kind of stuff. But that was that was intentional, too. Um, cause it took me a little while. To, there's a lot, there's a lot of poems to sift through. So it took me a little while, um, to really hone in on which ones that I wanted to use. 
Um, and I think, I think our audience will see why once we get started with the poems, because um, not only do, do, I think they also express um, why we would like them. And so people, our audience are actually going to get to know us a little bit better because of, of uh -huh. where, where we, we went to for that selection, right? Right, right. Which one do you want to start with? Um, I'd like to start with Mary Oliver, and I want to just give you a little background that I um, I, I had learned. I had known some of this, but um, she is still alive, which is pretty cool. You know, <laughs> of um, she's eighty three years old, and she lived most of her life in Massachusetts, but she lives in Florida now. Mm -hmm. um, she had a female partner, um, Molly Malone Cook for 40 years um, and she died um, in 2005. So you can go through Mary's poems and even find, you know, poems about grieving and using nature to heal with grief. Mm -hmm. You can, during that, that time that she lost her partner too. Um, a story I loved reading about her was she would walk in, she, she lived in Providence, Massachusetts, and she would walk in a wetland like daily. She would go out for outdoor walks, mm -hmm. um, do her own little forest therapy walks. And while she was out walking, she would be inspired by, you know, some bird would fly by. Like there's one, one poem where she was watching a bird playing with a feather and the bird would drop the feather and then fly down and, let it fall and fly down and catch it and then fly up and drop it again. You know, she would be inspired by what she saw and, but she was always like not having anything to write with. So she started, she started hiding pencils in trees. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> she just started hiding pencils on her path along the way. Cause she said, I always had, you know, some scrap of paper in my uh, pocket, but I never had the pencil, you know? So I thought that was, so funny, hiding pencils in trees. She is right now considered the, the best selling poet in the United States. Oh, really? Mary Oliver. Wow. Best selling poet. She has 40 poetry book collections and four nonfiction books. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one that I got is called Owls, Owls and Other Fantasies. This is this is the one that I got last year. Mm -hmm. So there's like 40 of these. And this is a lot about uh, birds and the topic of, of different different birds and that just takes me into the the very first poem in this book and the one that I want to share is called wild geese Nashi. yep I'm gonna bring that one up should go up and this is a poem that was shared um, in my very first class with forest therapy and um, <clears throat> and can it go all the way up or it's not? That, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Oh, okay. So well, uh, I have, you're going to have to read it, I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, but there's a part of this. There's, there's, um, well, I'll read it and then I'll share with, share with you my favorite parts of it. It's called Wild Geese. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies, and the deep trees, the mountains, and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. Wow. And this poem, yeah, this poem I use a lot of times to open a forest therapy walk. Um, 
Because forest therapy is all about pleasure. And I love the line, you only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. And for me, that line is talking about finding pleasure in nature, being outside. And also calling yourself an animal puts you in a part of the animal kingdom that we are as humans, as right. a part of nature. It right. makes us, you know, not better, not worse, an equal part of that of that whole. Mm -hmm. And and she ends it with the family of things that we are a part of that family. Right. And um, yeah, that we're not so, separate. That we're not separate. We're not separate. From. Right. The soft animal of your body. How you know how many times? I mean, do you ever think about yourself like an animal? I I love that. Well, I'm a, a soft animal body. You know. We are. Well, I know. I, the reason I'm kind of laughing is like, well, yeah, because, you know, when, you, when you're doing the shamanic uh, path, of, yeah, because, you know, we take on the aspects of our power animal. And so. Um, right. Yeah. About shape shifting the other day in your show. And, yeah. Yeah. So, and then sometimes, I mean, when everything is aligned and with, um, with spirit, in this home and the geese will fly over mm -hmm. our group and then then that's just like wow you know <laughs> wow i've had that happen a few times so uh, yeah it's so it's one of it's one of my favorites of hers yeah and, and there's and another so, one i hope we, yeah, I, I just hope want we can to, read it all because i don't yeah okay hang, hang on i just want to share this um that stephanie uh put in the the chat um, about Mary Oliver's um, books, um, Owls and Other Fantasies, and, and the link to it. So thank you, Stephanie. We appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. All right. So which other one did you want? The other Mary Oliver one, which I'm hoping I can read the whole thing. If not, I can get it up on Facebook here. Um, let's see. I just got to. Enough. Is that why I wake early? That one? Yeah. Yeah. Why I wake early. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing the bottom of it. So hmm. let me get it up in another place. Huh. Hmm. Sure. Let me see. Okay. Did you get it? No. All right, I so wasn't smart. And I didn't print mine out like now she did. Well, maybe you can read the last line for me. Do you have I, it? I do. I did print it. Print it out. Um, I see it on my screen <laughs> actually. Because the very bottom. The the What's the last line? The last line is in happiness and kindness. Watch now how I yeah. start. Yeah, that's the last line. Yeah, I can't see that, but I'll let you finish. Okay. okay. All right. How's that? Yep. We'll I'll look. This one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So why I wake early? Hello, sun in my face. Hello, you who made the morning and spread it over the fields and into the faces of the tulips, the nodding morning glories, and into the windows of even the miserable and the crotchety. Best creature that ever was. Dear star, that just happens to be where you are in the universe to keep us from ever darkness, to ease us with warm touching, to hold us in the hands the great hands of light. And that's where I can't read anymore, Nashi. <laughs> okay, great hands of light. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Watch now how I start the day in happiness and in kindness. Mary Oliver. Yeah. So this poem is about the sun. Mm -hmm. And I love best preacher that ever was, I think is one of my favorite lines in that poem. And 
and dear star, you know, calling it a star, mm -hmm. the sun. Um, I, I love, I love those parts of the poem. And, yes, the, the dear star that just happens to be where you are in the universe. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. That was that, and um, to hold us the great hands of light. I like that one too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, George, George is awake, and so I'm trying to keep him entertained. <laughs> I was going to say, I was just throwing, so just just throwing him at me. <laughs> Yep. Mary Oliver. You know, I didn't I really didn't know Mary Oliver until you shared the poems. And I really like her a lot. I can see why she's the number one poet in the US. Yeah, she is really um she's she's much more popular than I realized because I'll put a poem up and people will go, Oh yeah, Mary Oliver, I love her. I know that. Uh -huh. Um, so, so I realized that she's, she's more famous that I just didn't, I learned about her late, you know, I learned about her late, but a lot of people know about her. Yeah. Um, but I think if I was just starting with poetry, mm -hmm. I would choose her. Yeah. I would, I would choose her because you can, it, she's very relatable, you know, and her poems aren't really long either. Yes. And, you know, when I was doing the research for the poems, I tell you what, there's there's some that were really, really long. And it almost almost like I don't want to call it a short story, but it was very similar to that. You know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So do you want to do um, the next one? Yeah, the, um, the Robert Frost. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, so Robert Frost, uh, born in 1874, died in 1963. So he was, you know, still alive, um, you know, in the beginning of my lifetime, which is cool because I always think of him as older. And I can't see that one either, darn it. Oh, um, okay. Would you, like, <laughs> would you like me to read it? Yeah, I'll have you read it. Let me talk about him a little bit. Okay. And then I'll have you read it. Um, so he's a farmer in Vermont. And I think one of his most famous poems, you know, or at least the poem that I knew was the one about the road not taken. You know, that there was, I diverged on, on a path. Uh-oh. We lost Minnie. <laughs> Where did Minnie go? I don't know. She'll be back. She'll be back. Um, I think what I can do is I can read the poem while we're waiting for her to come back. Yeah, because what she'll need to do is she's going to, um, no, see, she knows exactly what to do. Hang on, Minnie. Hold, hold the phone. That's an old saying. Hold the phone. We <laughs> lost you. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, could you hear me or not? <laughs> no, the last I heard was that he was a farmer. It was in Vermont. Yes. Yeah, that was yes, the last thing I heard. Farmer. Oh, geez. So, um, so he's, he's well known for the poem called The Road Not Taken. Right. Where you, you know, came across two paths and, and he chose the one that was not as, as well traveled. And that made all the difference in his life. He said, mm -hmm. um, but this poem I love because it reminds me of a force therapy of just stopping and being with the energy and the intelligence and beingness of, of nature in, in the woods on a, on a quiet night. And, and he wrote this about the, the winter solstice as well. Um, so that was, that was really cool for me. And he, he said he wrote about nature um, because it was a distraction from the everyday responsibilities of his life that he loved. And, and for me, you know, again, 
forest therapy takes us away from from that stresses of of daily life and um, helps helps us to focus on something else, something richer, something deeper, something for me that feeds my soul mm -hmm. in a really nourishing way. Mm -hmm. So Would go like ahead, Nashi. All right, hang on. Let me grab, let me grab some, some of George's <laughs> So it's just it's multitasking. <laughs> All right. It's called Stepping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch the woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there's some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. One of my favorite poems. <laughs> yes. Yes. It is. It's beautiful, and especially like for this time of year, I think too. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, this is the poem where I was I was doing a little research on it, and they were asking him, "Were you were you thinking about committing suicide in the woods when you wrote this poem?" And he was like, "No, <laughs> you know <laughs> what like what people interpret in." in um in poetry because he stopped and just was still you know what was mm -hmm. he what was he doing there you know right um, but i understand he was he was between you know farmhouse he wasn't where he had to be yet he was just wanting to um be in the stillness of the forest uh -huh. and on uh, you know and on the solstice too right right yeah. His horse is like going, wait a minute, we don't usually do this. You know, what's going on? You know, um, you know how he, how he talks about that. It's almost like the horse is talking to him. It's like, what, 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 what why do we, do we stop? Here? What's going on? <laughs> um, is there some mistake? Yeah, I, we really? have a couple of, of um, comments here. Julie Hill is saying, a yeah. film, a familiar poem from my younger years. Absolutely. Madonna is yeah. saying, I love Robert Frost. So why? Yeah. Stephanie is saying, that looks almost like a, vil like a villanelle. Frost did some amazing poetry. Yeah, he did. I mean, even when you. There's I mean, something about the poem. And I don't, I don't know all the you know, fancy words, the pentameters and all of that. But the way he wrote this poem is really intricate. Yes. As, as far as poetry goes. Uh -huh. And he said he wrote in the night and he didn't even think about any of that it just came out of him it uh -huh. wasn't like he intellectually said oh i need a word that rhymes with this and that you know yeah. he said it he, he wrote it in one night boom mm -hmm. <laughs> so. well you know and and wouldn't you say that this is a prime example too of somebody who's using their gifts he didn't stop to try to you know make it um educational and say did it this way or that way and we lost many again um <laughs> We're going to blame it on, on Mercury retrograde, you know. Um, but it, I noticed the same thing is that, you know, um, is that Robert Frost didn't exactly, you know, stop and say, okay, I, I educationally, you know, using all of the different aspects of a poem to be able to have um, the explanation there. He just wrote it. Um, and I think that that's holy cow. I was just saying that this is some a prime example of somebody who is using their their gifts that they came in with because it, it just came to him so easily. So easily. Right. Yeah. And you can and you can go online and hear him reciting his poems too. Really? Um, you know, even though he died in 1963, we we have recordings of him and so there'll be like a picture of him or the poem and him reciting it and I would encourage um, our listeners to go do that because it, it's really fun to hear the the poet. So, what would you, you know? what did you think of his voice? Did you hear it? Yes. Well, he's very handsome too. I mean, the pictures of him are whoa. 
Um, uh, and he's got a really deep, rich, handsome voice. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I'm saying. You should, you should go listen to him because then you get a whole other layer of him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and it's those last two lines, and miles to go before I sleep, I think those are the most famous last two lines of a poem because we even use them in everyday everyday language kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. And we're usually talking about we've got so much to do, and yet we still, you know... So I have miles to go before right. I sleep. That's right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like Robert Frost. Thank you for bringing that one to us. That was a good one. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. So that was my favorite. And then, and then my my final poet. <laughs> yes. Let me let me keep going. I did, I, did write, I have this one written down, but um, I was. Michelle Silverstein, uh, he's he's very, what do I want to say? Um, he's an author, a poet, a songwriter. He's won like two Grammys. Um, it's amazing what, he won a Grammy for the song A Boy Named Sue. He wrote the song The Unicorn that the Irish Rovers sing, that we uh -huh. always sing for St. Patrick's Day, and he wrote the song, The Cover of the Rolling Stones. Um, and then he's written, like, a lot of us know The Giving Tree, the book The Giving Tree, uh -huh. um, where the sidewalk ends. Um, um, gosh, there's another one upstairs, upstairs, upside down something. But uh, my favorite book, and I was saying, <laughs> this is my family's um, craziness. Rain found this book called Zell Silverstein's The ABZ Book. ABZ. Now, it looks like a children's book, but if you start reading it, you realize very quickly it's not a children's book. Um, but it's it's funny. It's, it's like a book that you would go, I'm going to, you know, buy this for my grandchildren to just bother my kids with because there's things in here like um uh, let's see um well now it's time for uncle selby's potty training see the potty the potty is deep the potty has water in the bottom maybe somebody will fall in the potty and drown don't worry as long as you keep wetting your pants you'll never drown in the potty <laughs> <laughs> so it's not good advice <laughs> but it's funny as heck. Um, it's funny as heck. That's just his humor. And then, I mean, he'll say, you know, you know, you if you wanna, you wanna, um, they're giving away free ponies. Go, go down and ask for a free pony at the gas station or something like that. You know, um, it's 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 just crazy. And. You know, Rain would, my husband would memorize one of his favorite ones that he's memorized is called Someone Ate the Baby, you know. <laughs> so they're just, just, they're crazy, but they're fun. And my kids, so my kids were raised on this book, <laughs> but they were told it wasn't, it's not true stuff, you know. But he actually does, you know, he shows them, you know, the A, B, C, D, E, F, G song, but he's saying it's A, B, Z, D, E, F, G. So he's. You know, trying to teach them the alphabet incorrectly <laughs> too, and it's fun. And I think yeah. it's really interesting because his his history is his wife died young. Um, he had a three year old daughter when his wife five year old daughter when his wife died, and then that daughter died at eleven from an aneurysm. So the gentleman had a lot of grief in his life and grief with children. And yet he wrote things, he did things like this, you know? And he later had a son um, later in life with another woman. But mm -hmm. you're like, wow. But this one, this poem, I just, I, it, it's typical Shel Silverstein. I had to laugh because this is the kind of poem that would be in the ABZ book. And um, I'll just read it. I made myself a snowball as perfect as could be. I thought I'd keep it as a pet and let it sleep with me. I made it some pajamas and a pillow for its head. Then last night it ran away. But first 
it wet the bed. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a tough show, you know, he's just, he's so cute. he's so funny. So, you know. Um, oh my God, that's so funny. <laughs> it's, it's very, it, it's very him. And even like in this book, there'd be like, um, oh, here's a spot, your, your shiny free quarter is in the, you know, you get a shiny free quarter um, with every book. And then it looks like a spot where something's been torn away. And it's like, unless your mom already took the quarter. <laughs> Go ask her where your quarter is. Things like that, you know. It must have been at Aldi's. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, you know, if you want to laugh, Michelle Silverstein's ABZ book is quite fun. Well, I mean, they're yeah. yeah, you know, and poetry is, is can be joyful and, and funny and um, entertaining, yeah. you know, entertaining. So, yeah, that's a good one. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. So the ones that I oh, Yeah, the ones that I yeah. chose. Um, wait a minute, we have one here. Um, <laughs> Stephanie is saying, Oh my god, I remember that poem, Snowball Wet the Bed. <laughs> it's all right. Um, okay, so you know, there almost everybody knows this about me is how much I love Rumi. And and you know, and a lot of people do. And he's one of the, um, I think, one of the one of the poets who are the most quoted poets. But you know, there were some things that I found out about Rumi that that I had to say. Oh, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> Is that um, he was born December seventeenth, twelve uh, twelve seventy three. So he was he was a Sagittarian. Uh -huh. and, he was born in what's now Turkey. No, I'm sorry. He was born, I'm sorry. He died in September, on December 17th, um, 1273. He was born in September 30th, 12, 1207, what's now Afghanistan. And so a lot of people don't realize that, you know, they know that he was from the Middle East, but they don't really know from which countries. Um, Afghanistan, and so thought, yeah. That, yeah, and that um, he was a, a Sufi mystic and poet um, mm -hmm. in the language famous for his lyrics and his didactic epic uh spiritual couplets and that's what those are the ones that we we um use as quotes so often so often um right yeah and so um there was something in here i just have to find it's that after his death his disciples were organized in in a i can't pronounce this word Malau, Malawila, yeah, order. And so I didn't realize that there was an order actually started after he died, not while he was living, but after he died. Yeah. From his followers. Yes. And it says by the end of the 20th century, his popularity had become global, a global phenomenon um, with his poetry achieving wild <coughs> circulation in Western Europe and the United States. You know, and of course, do George need, now. Do you need to take care of? George? I do. I do. You want to take Rumi? And okay, I'll talk a little bit about Rumi while you're. That's great. Let me get the picture up for you, though, and um, we'll do that. George, okay. just a moment. And please. I have it. You have it. I can read out? things full now. Okay. Yeah. Now that I'm not doing my post, I can read. I just yours. have to find. <laughs> God, I it. Oh, there it is. I passed it up. Okay. Okay. There we go. And I am going to take my. Well, he has to go. He has to go. <laughs> okay. So, like Nashi said, Rumi, um, we see him. His his words used a lot um, with images, just as Facebook posts, because they're so beautiful. And then here's a poem that Nashi found um, that she really loves. Um, if you want the moon. Do not hide from the night. If you want a rose, do not run from the thorns. If you want love, do not hide from yourself. Rumi. And for me, Rumi's always got a lesson in there. There's always a lesson in his poems or there's a lesson in even 
the little excerpt that someone took out of his writing that they put with an image. Um, and, you know, this poem is about, um, you know, if, if you want to see the moon, you have, you have to have the night. You have to go be out in the darkness. You have to, what does that mean in your life? That you, you have to experience the darkness to get the joy of seeing the moon and the illumination of the moon. I'm a, I'm a triple cancer, so I love the moon. So um, I'm out in the dark, I'm out in the night, and I'm not scared because I get to see the moon when I'm out there. So it's worth it. And if you want a rose, don't run from the thorns. So roses come with thorns. You know, I'm a gardener, uh, picking roses, pruning roses, get poked with those thorns all the time, but I love roses. So it's kind of this message, you know, you're going to take the good with the bad, or, you know, there's always a yin and a yang side to, to what we experience in life. And, um, you know, the last one, of course, if you want love, do not hide from yourself. And to me, that's, that's speaking about you know if you want love in your life you have to love yourself first you have to know who you are before you can be a lover for someone else you got to be in love with yourself you got to um, cherish you before someone else can see that and cherish and cherish you to see that in you so it, it's you know again lessons in his words lessons um, in his poems, and um, he's, he is a Sufi mystic, and he's written so many pieces, it's not just one, but so many pieces that Rumi, Rumi has written, and there's volumes, mm -hmm. there's volumes of his writing, he was very prolific, and he wrote so much so, about, now she, what, is this, what does this mean to you, I, I, I shared what all the lines meant to me, but what does this mean to you? Yeah, it, what it means to me is that we can't hide and we shouldn't hide. We shouldn't hide from love and that we should um, actually find that source of love, you know, because I like the way that he uses the nature piece about if you want the moon, do not do not hide from the night. In other words, you know, if you if you want to have illumination, you have to understand what's in the darkness first, right? Mm -hmm. Can't be scared of the dark, right? Be of it. And so you have to be, um, and that's one of the reasons why I think he wrote so much about love is because it's the opposite of hate. It's the opposite of fear, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, if you want love, do not hide from yourself because there's so many times that we look outside of ourselves for that, that love and and those and so many times it, that becomes very elusive, right? We end up we end up trying to find it every every was that um, finding love in all the wrong places. Yeah, looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> places. Right. right, and so um, yeah, don't hide, you can't hide from yourself, even if you try. Eventually, eventually you have to you have to turn turn inward to find that. That's one of my favorite ones, anyway. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. And the other one that I had um, was Joyce Kilmer. And Joyce Kilmer. Um, I'll make sure I have it all here. <clears throat> Joyce Kilmer. Um, I got a little uh, background with Joyce Kilmer. When I was a kid, I performed um, down at some place called uh, Stan Rock Indian Ceremonial. And I performed there from the time I was, I think, 13 um, until I was 17. And um, mm -hmm. there, there, was, there, was an, there was a person, a Native American man who sang there, Tom Toby was his name. And one of the songs that he sang was actually this poem that was set to music. Um, and uh, yeah, so so when I when I thought, well, which poems do I use? That's the one that kind of popped in my head because I love uh -huh. that poem. 
And for it to be even to be set to music was really, I think, really special. But with Joyce Kilmer, um, he was born in 1886 and died in 1918. And so he was 32 years old when he passed away. Um, he was a journalist and he was born and, and also a poet. He was born in New Brunswick, New Jersey. He was known for poetry that celebrated the common beauty of, of the natural world, as well as his religious faith. He was killed after enlisting in the United States Army during, during World War I. Kilmer was awarded the French wow. prestigious um, Croix de Guerre War Cross for his bravery, and a section of the National Forest in North Carolina is named after him. Um, he was actually, um, it says that at the time of deployment, he was widely regarded as a leading Catholic American poet of his generation. He was actually shot by a sniper's bullet in France. So, wow. Yeah, I, and I didn't know that part about him. That he, that, you know, that I didn't he, either. Um, and so this is one of my favorite ones. Let me give it a solo here. I think that I shall never see mm -hmm. a poem lovely as a tree. A tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's flowing breast. A tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray. A tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair. Upon whose bosom snow has lain, who ultimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. <laughs> I just love that. And it reminds me so much of my childhood, you know, um, mm. I had memories about that. It also meant that when he was singing that, we were close to the end of the show. <laughs> so then be going home for you. Oh. This is, this is one of my favorite ones. And, you know, and even when I read it, I can hear Ken Toby singing it, you know, and I, I saw that Julie, oh. Julie Hill is in, in the, uh, the chat. She's from Wisconsin Dells. We grew up together, went to the same school. So I don't know, Julie, if you've ever, if you ever heard uh, or went to Stand Rock and heard, heard that song, that poem being sung by Tom Toby. He had such a deep uh, baritone voice too. Um, yeah, but it's one of my favorites. And just reading the poem in in the trees, you know, my favorite line in there is that. Um, a tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair. <laughs> I like that part. Yeah, like yeah. like adornments. I love it. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, when was the first time you heard that poem? Because it's actually a pretty well-known poem. Mm. First time? Oh, probably in high school. Um, yeah, I. I I loved any any poem that talked about nature even then. So you know, and and the the beginning of it, I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree to think about a tree being a poem. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember that line like, wow, never thought about that. Yeah. So and then the last lines, you know, poems are made by fools like me. Am I echoing? I feel like no, no, I don't hear you echo at all. Oh, so it might just, and it good, might just good. be at your end. It doesn't sound bad because enough. you know the he, the poet, you know, but but only God can make a tree which is way better than a poem. You know, it's kind of what he's saying. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. The real thing is the best. The real thing is the best. Yeah, yeah. I can only write about it and describe it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and there, there. I chose this next poem because, um, well, one, I really like it a lot. But um, John or Edwin yeah. Muir um, is, or John Muir, I'm sorry, is John Muir. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. John Muir is. I think that that's one of the things that you and I have in common, is John Muir and how much we respect and and respect him and everything that he did for for the environment oh. and the naturalists yeah. and, and that sort of thing, you know, and um, yeah. So <clears throat> I was just, I'm just gonna read the poem because I don't really like the biography that I got for him. Hang on, there we go, we're gonna give it a solo. 
This is the grand mm -hmm. show is eternal. Yeah. It is always sunrise somewhere. The dew is never all dried at once. A shower is forever falling. Vapor is ever rising. Eternal sunrise, eternal sunset, eternal dawn and gloaming. On sea and continent and islands, each in its turn as the round, the round earth rolls. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I just really like this one a lot. And you know the, the, that was the first time I'd ever seen the word gloaming. I didn't know what that meant, and so I, I had to look. Uh -huh. it <laughs> and really, it's it's uh, it's about that time between um, um, sunset. Um, so the sun's not quite set yet; it's just down at the horizon, and um, and so it's a really special time, right? Um, it's a twin time. It's yeah. a twin time. And this poem really does remind me about the unity breath meditation that I did. Ah, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 It does. Yeah, there's definitely that flowing movement in it. Mm -hmm. You know, that cycling. Yep. Yeah. And you and I were just talking about that before the show about how and poetry to me depend especially nature poems. I mean is that you can actually feel the cycles of the seasons in their poems and, and how they're written and how they flow. You know, even though they might not be written about the seasons, um, you can still feel it, the, the shifting and the changing of it. Um, that the eternal sunrise right, right. and eternal sunset, eternal dawn and gloaming. And to me, it also talks about our life and that we're... Um, that as spiritual beings, we're, we're eternal. You know, we our, our our souls live on, right? And our bodies return yeah, yeah. to Grandmother Earth. And uh, that's what that I just love this one. So, well, how, did, how do you? Ow! How do you feel about um, John Muir? Can you tell us a little? Because I know that you you have a oh great connection to him. I love him. I love him so much. Um, one of the coolest stories I have about John Muir is, is that my mother loved his work so much. She had a lot of his books. And what my son Stefan did for my mom when she couldn't read anymore is he he taped, he recorded he on CDs uh, about three of his books for mom so she could still hear his words. Mm -hmm. And when we were doing hospice care with mom, those are some of the CDs that she wanted to hear. And so even though Stefan was in Colorado and we were in Michigan, it felt like he was there saying goodbye to his grandmother through his words. And I would just walk in the room and it was really hard not to cry because, you know, I'm hearing him talk to his grandma, you know, hearing my son talk to his grandmother. So that's a beautiful gift that you can give someone. Like I would love to hear, you know, John Muir CDs as I'm going, you know, as I'm getting ready to go. You guys put that down. Remember that for me. Um, but you know, it his work is and and what he did, um, you know, for um, the national park system. I mean, he really like Yosemite. His his work mm -hmm. in Yosemite. Right. Um, is amazing. He brought the presidents out there and he had them spend the night in, you know, um, in the woods with him, even. I think it was Teddy Roosevelt. I, yeah. 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 Um, and it, it, it's just, it's so cool, the stories that he that he shares, that he has. So, mm -hmm. and, and lots of times his quotes are used with those beautiful images um, yes. for inspiration. Yeah. Yes. So, um, yeah. And he's widely quoted as well, almost as much as Rumi. Yeah, yeah. When it comes yeah. to these quotes, um, I, I don't know. This has been so much fun. I'm so glad that we that that you had this inspiration and that we decided to do it. It's it's really been fun, and I hope our audience, um, when the next time they have a chance to um, to read some poetry or to, when they see a piece of poetry, um, especially about nature, that. You know, it's a way. It's a way that we get to connect to Grandmother Earth and Grandfather Sky. And, uh, definitely, yeah. yeah, definitely. So, Minnie, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? 
Well, my sister is on the way here. I mean, she's she's due in probably five minutes. Um, um, sister and brother-in-law and nephew are coming here to spend the night, and then tomorrow we head on down to Indiana, two hours south of us, um, for a re kind of a reunion from my mom's side of the family of thirty to forty people, wow. uh, cousins, second cousins, the third cousins. Um, so it's it's really fun because all the kids still gather, even though all the all the patriarchs and you know matriarchs have passed on. My mom's whole family is gone now, uh -huh. but we all all the cousins are still holding the family together here, and and we actually stay on land that's on my grandfather's farm. So where we used to go for Thanksgiving when I was a baby, we're we're going back to that land because my cousin built a house on on the the back pig lot. We, we call it it's a beautiful woods now but they all inherited land when my grandfather died and they all inherited a tiny section and so all the brothers and sisters gave all their land deeded all their land to this one cousin that wanted to build a house there and mm -hmm. now they have thanksgiving every year there so it's a really beautiful tradition and my grandfather's house is still standing um, last time we were there no one was living in it but you know we always are we always go visit it and we go visit the little tiny town it's lagrange indiana it probably has 500 people living in it we walk around town after thanksgiving so it's fun it's it's a really fun time to tap into that side of my family yeah. uh, that's nice what about you it's actually kind of going back to ancestral land um it is, it is. <laughs> well you know it's 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 gun hunting season here for deer and so paul that's where paul's going to be oh. at. um and so it's going to be a little bit a little bit quiet at my house, just a little bit. I've got George to, to take care of, um, who, who is jumping at the bit because he's, he's used to being done with work. Now, see, <laughs> he's, he's ready to go yeah. home by the door. Um, and so we're, we're really not doing much. I'm going to watch the Macy Day Parade. I'm not going to do a live stream tomorrow or Friday. I'm taking a couple of days off. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, well, I'm still going to be working, but I won't be doing. Um, on, online stuff, which is a little bit of a break. Yep. And, uh, and so, yeah, we're going to be doing a special dinner for the mothers, for my mom and for my mother-in-law on Sunday. And so Paul and I will be doing some, some kitchen time together, which is always fun. So that's what we're going to be doing. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to be calling it gratitude day. We're going to do gratitude day. Yeah. Yeah. It takes some time for you. Yeah. yeah. That would be good. Absolutely. Well, you say hi to rain for us and um, we'll be back I next will. month for nature adventures on the third Wednesday at what time? 4 p.m. Eastern. 4 p.m. Eastern. <laughs> we'll get it figured out. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All, right. All right. Thanks, everybody, for being with us. We, Thank we you, everybody. It. Yeah. And we'll see you next month. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah.